Tenemos el placer de tener con nosotros a la profesora Sonja Liubomirsky, que es una de las grandes expertas mundiales en psicología positiva y en concreto en el estudio de la felicidad. Y la profesora Sonja Liubomirsky se ha planteado la pregunta, ¿es posible ser feliz? Y si es posible ser feliz, ¿cómo seguir siéndolo? ¿Cómo mantener la felicidad? Y lo ha demostrado empíricamente con una serie de estudios que nos va a mostrar que han sido publicados en revistas muy prestigiosas en las que ella muestra formas eficaces para ser feliz. Gracias. I don't know what he said, but I hope it was nice. Um, thank you so much for inviting me here. I am so delighted to be in this beautiful part of Spain where I've never been before. I'm going to be talking about my work on happiness described in my book called The How of Happiness or La Ciencia de la Felicidad in Spanish. So I'm going to show you what researchers have found when they have surveyed how important happiness is around the world. Americans rated between a six and a seven, where seven is the, the most important possible. So it's about six and a half. Uh, and I have as examples here, Greece, Germany, South Africa, China, and Argentina. And you can see that people in other countries also rated very highly. I believe that we all want to be happy. Happier people have been found to be more productive and more creative. They make more money and have superior jobs. They're better leaders and negotiators. Um, they have more social benefits. If you're happier today, the happiest people in this room are going to be more likely 10 years from now to be married, to have satisfying marriages, to have more friends. Happier people are healthier, they have stronger immune systems, they live longer, they're more helpful and philanthropic. I mean, there's this idea that people who care about their happiness are really self-centered, that they, are, they care more about themselves than about other people, but actually the research shows that happier people are more other-centered, they're more helpful and generous to others, There's been a lot of pessimism in the scientific literature about even the very question is, can we become happier than we already are? I've decided that that pessimism is really unwarranted. It's unneeded. And I have this very simple argument, this simple conclusion, that despite the fact that our happiness is partially genetically determined, and despite the fact that our life situations don't affect our happiness as much as we think they do, or they will, still I argue that a very large portion of our happiness, up to 40%, is in our power to change. So what we have concluded is that the set point, the genetic set point, genetics, account for about 50% of the differences in happiness levels. This means that everyone sitting here in this room If I turned everyone with a magic wand into a genetic clone of each other, if you were all genetically the same, you would still differ in your happiness levels, but those differences would be reduced by 50%. So about 10% of our happiness differences are due to our life circumstances. Some of us are healthier or more beautiful or have more money than others. And so this leaves 40% for what I call intentional activity. By the way, some of that 40% undoubtedly is measurement error, but we'll just sort of round, round to 40%. Intentional activity, this is what we can do to become happier through the ways that we act and the ways that we think, through our activities. Happiness is a, is a subjective phenomenon, right? It's something that only you know how happy you are. No one else can tell you how happy you are. Researchers uh, argue that happiness has two, has two components. The first is the experience of positive emotions like joy, curiosity, interest, affection, enthusiasm, peacefulness. Um, but that's not enough, right? You can experience a lot of positive emotions and not truly be a happy person. The second component is a sense that you are satisfied with your life, you're, you're content 
with the way you're progressing towards your goals in life. And we define happiness as it is defined empirically. We ask people, how happy are you? I will show you some, some measure, measures of happiness. The first about 10 years of my career, um, I did research where I just compared people who are happy and people who are less happy. And you know, journalists, the media, would call me often and they would always ask me, well, what can we tell our readers from your research about what they can do to become happier? And I would always say, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, all I know is that happy people do this, but it's a correlational finding, right? Just because happy people are more grateful, that doesn't mean that if I'm more grateful, I will become happier. We have to do experiments to do that. And so I started doing experiments. And so today, I just want to quickly tell you about three happiness interventions that we have done, starting with one where we asked people to commit acts of kindness. In this study, what we did was we had participants do either three or nine acts of kindness per week for a period of 10 weeks. Um, and I, it's just a kind of a complicated study, and I'll show you the more kind of, uh, I'll show you some of the data. So we had a high variety condition where people um, could choose any act of kindness that they want to do out of a list that they give us out of 15 acts. Low variety, people choose three acts of kindness, and then they do them over and over again. So for example, you might choose, if you live with your family, or you live with roommates, you might choose to do a chore in your house that you don't normally do. So for example, let's say you don't normally wash the dishes, so you surprise your family by washing the dishes every night. So you kind of do that. So that, that, that would be an act of kindness. And the control condition, people just listed events that happened to them each week. Um, and then to measure happiness or well-being, we usually use um, several validated standard scales. The subjective happiness scale is a scale that I developed. There's just an overall measure. How happy are you as a person? In general, I consider myself you know, not a very happy person, a very happy person. Um, a global happiness item just asks, how happy are you these days? Our instructions to our subjects, and I'm just going to read the, the green, is we would like you to list 15 acts of kindness that you would like to do more in the future. Only write down acts of kindness that are easily repeatable. And I have some examples like if you go to a coffee shop, you know, let someone in line ahead, you know, who's in a hurry ahead of you, things like that. Um, and then you, we want you to choose three of these acts or nine and just do them every week for 10 weeks. Okay, so here are our data. So what we found is that doing acts of kindness did make people happier but only those who varied their acts of kindness, who did different things every week. So the red line are people who were in the high variety condition, and you see they got happier. So this is before the study, middle of the study, after the study, a month later. And importantly, their happiness increase was maintained for a month after the study was over, when people were no longer doing these acts of kindness. Um, the control group is the blue line. I think they just maintain the same level of happiness. Um, interestingly, the people who were um, told to do the same sort of act of kindness every week, they actually got less happy in the middle of the study and then they rebounded. And I think it was just, it just became a chore, you know, like something you have to do. And obviously, um, if you want to be happier, you need to kind of you want to do it because you want to do it, not because you're sort of being forced to do this. And the thing about our experiments is that we randomly assign people, you know, you do this, you do that, which is, doesn't really mirror real life. Actually, I'll talk about that in a second. We also found some interesting other results. Here's a, a mediator that we found. So we found that ki doing kind acts leads to happiness, but we also found a partial mediator such that people who committed kind acts, they saw that other people were grateful to them. Okay, so this is a perceived gratitude. And that made, so committing kind acts led people to perceive gratitude. Perceived gratitude led people to be happier. And if you put perceived gratitude into the equation, then um, it became non-significant. So that this, this suggests that, um, 
that seeing how, you know, how you made other people happy basically is a, is a partial mediator or a mechanism of this effect. So we did a study where people were instructed to write for 15 minutes per week over the course of eight weeks. And here we had uh, two experimental conditions. People expressed optimism by writing about their best possible future selves, and I'll explain what that means. They expressed gratitude by writing letters of gratitude, and the control condition, people just listed what they did over the past seven days. And we, we told them, this is kind of like an organizational strategy, it'll help you organize your time. So it was also a positive strategy. Okay, so the optimism condition, we had people to think, think about the next 10 years of your life, okay? So imagine, what are your dreams for your life in 10 years? Now these were younger people, it doesn't have to be 10 years, it could be five years. Um, imagine that all your dreams have come true and then write about what you envisioned your life to be in 10 years. And every week, they wrote about a different domain. So one week it'd be, it could be their romantic life, their relationships, another week it would be their career. And then in the gratitude condition, we asked people to write gratitude letters. We've already talked about that with Kim. So write a letter to someone who you you know, who's been really kind to you, you've never properly thanked them, write them a letter. And each week, they can write a letter. The next week, they can write uh, a letter to a different person, or they can continue the same letter. They don't share the letter with the person. It's interestingly, they don't actually share the letter, so you don't actually send the letter. We're just, we're, I'm just interested in, does the act of sitting down and writing about how grateful you are to someone, is that gonna make you happier? Even when you don't actually give the letter to that person. I was interested in testing the role of motivation. So um, what we wanted to do is we wanted to recruit people who are really motivated to become happier as opposed to people who are not as motivated to become happier. Now, we, we, we had trouble figuring out a way to do this experimentally. So we decided to do it non-experimentally. So what we did is, in a sense, we recruited people. We told them, um, you know, do you want to be happier? We're doing this study where we're trying to get people happier. Come be in our study, right? And so assuming that people would sign up if they're really interested in being happier. Or we just told them, we're doing a kind of a generic study on cognitive exercises. Um, come be in our study. So that's the low motivation group that signed up for that. So we had six groups, a two by three design, um, where we had motivated subjects and non-motivated, and they either practice optimism, gratitude, or there was a control group. And the two, the, the two cells that are in white, you see over there, um, we expected that people who were trying to be optimistic or grateful and who were motivated, they would be the two conditions that would get the most benefit from our intervention. And the idea here, and the paper that is based on, the, I wrote a paper based on this study, and the paper is called, It Takes Both a Will and a Way to Become Happier. A will, you need the will to become happier, the motivation, but you also need a successful, effective strategy. So it takes both a will and a way to become happier. And then these are our experimental groups that I think even more important to show. Um, if you look at the people who are trying to be more optimistic or people who are trying to be more grateful by writing gratitude letters, those who are motivated got happier relative to those who were less motivated. And I should say in this study, and actually the next study I'm going to show, the gratitude intervention was more effective than the optimism intervention. Okay, and this is six months later. The pattern is still the same. The effect is smaller, but the pattern is the same, that if you're motivated and you're trying to be more grateful or, or you had tried to be more optimistic, you're, you got happier relative to people who are less motivated. Our hypothesis was that the pursuit of happiness is universal so that everyone would want to be happier, but we thought that anglo -Ameri we, we used Asian-Americans and Anglo-Americans, that Asian-Americans would sort of benefit differently from our intervention, that maybe they wouldn't benefit as much because there's not as much support in Asian cultures for the pursuit of happiness as there is in, in Anglo culture. Um, so what we did is we had the same design, but it was a, 
a little bit of a shorter study because it was a very expensive study to do. And so again, we had express optimism condition, an express gratitude condition, and we had a control condition. Um, so again, a two by three design, but this time we compared Anglo-Americans and Asian-Americans. The Asian-Americans were a little bit younger and less likely to be married. Um, most of them were born in Asian countries, and I just have some of the, the most common ones listed. And this is what we found. The Anglo-Americans are in green, and the Asian-Americans are in red. And so what you find here, and it's very interesting, let's just look at the Anglos. You see, they're, people who are being optimistic or grateful are getting happier relative to the control group. And the same thing with the Asian-Americans. You see an effect where the relative to the control group, being optimistic or grateful is more beneficial, but it's a lot weaker. And this is a month later, and we have the same pattern where you, still, you have the differences between the two experimental groups and the control groups, but the Anglo-Americans are getting more out of this intervention than the Asian-Americans. So I think, again, I think that we have support for this idea that there's less, less cultural support among the Asian Americans. I mean, I'm not really sure what's going on. We did find that the Asian Americans did not put as much effort into the interventions and they put less time into it. And so maybe they didn't take it as seriously. Maybe they didn't, you know, um, find it as, you know, as, as effective, as, as appealing as the, ang as the Anglo Americans. We also found evidence for three mediators of this uh, effect. So, why is it that practicing optimism and gratitude, why does that make people happier? We found that practicing optimism and gratitude leads people to experience more positive events in their life. It leads people to feel more relatedness with others or connectedness with other people. It leads people to feel more autonomy or a sense of control. And that mediates the relationship between these interventions and happiness. So that's what's happening when you're writing gratitude letters when you're dreaming about the future, is you're having more positive experiences on a weekly level. You feel more connected to others. You feel more in control of your life. Okay, future research directions. Um, we're doing a lot more happiness interventions, studying, testing more uh, happiness activities. But even more important, what I'm interested in really is questions like uh, about the moderators and the mediators of the success of these interventions. So, for example, do expectations matter? We just finished a study where we told people that practicing gratitude will make you happier. Does fit matter? One of the themes of my research is the importance of fit, that you need to choose the strategy that fits your personality and your goals. Does social support matter? Do habits matter? Why do they work? Another important question is, do doing these strategies um, do, do they, does that also alleviate depressive symptoms? I'd like to end with a quote from Aristotle, which is that happiness depends upon ourselves, which is kind of the gist of my research. And I guess I just want to conclude that I think happiness is a really worthwhile goal. And if it's a worthwhile goal, we really need to understand how, do you, how can you become happier? And people often ask me, well, you know, how do you kind of galvanize yourself to, to do these happiness strategies? And my answer is always that it takes a lot of work. And it's not easy, it takes effort and commitment to do that. You can use your phone. So for example, if you want to express gratitude, uh, it prompts you to go to your contacts list on your phone and text someone or f call someone or email someone and thank them. And, or for savoring, you go to your photo album and choose, say, a photo of me, say, myself and my daughter on vacation, and you write about you know, how much you love the, the photo. So that's just a way to get people to sort of do this on a regular basis, um, to kind of continue doing it. So um, anyway, thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here. And I'll be here signing my book um, after my talk. Thanks. <laughs>